Welcome to the Rinovaccio podcast. Rinovaccio is the journal of Zaytuna College. I'm Sarah Barnett, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Father Francisco Nahoy, who currently teaches courses in rhetoric and philosophy at Zaytuna College and serves there as the director of admissions. Father Francisco is a Roman Catholic priest and Franciscan friar. He has a wide range of teaching experience and among his many degrees holds a master's in comparative literature from Dartmouth and a PhD in Renaissance literature from the University of Nevada. Father Francisco, welcome. Thank you very much. I should um, say that I'm not the, the director of admissions at Zaytuna College anymore. Oh, you're not. <laughs> no, well, thank you but for that, adding that's that. okay. I, I, I still am very interested in admissions to the college. Excellent. Uh, well, Father Francisco, I, I wanted to start by sharing, if you'll allow me, um, a bit of background about my reading experiences, because today I wanted to talk with you a bit about uh, the great books um, and classics um, that we often study in um, university and um, the classroom and, and often don't bring enough perhaps into our daily lives. Um, now Please. I'm, so yeah, so I'm, I'm not an expert um, in Renaissance literature like yourself. Um, I don't go as far back as classical, um, ancient Greek or Roman literature, or even medieval. I'm actually a Victorianist, and so I spend most of my reading hours poring over 19th and early 20th century texts. Um, so this is George Eliot, Charles Dickens, the Bronte sisters. However, the, these authors um, who I read and study, um, they had close ties and reading relationships with classical, medieval, and Renaissance works. Um, so for instance, uh, the Bronte sisters, who were lovers of Sir Walter Scott's historical novels he wrote at the beginning of the 19th century. Um, Walter Scott, in turn, was heavily influenced by the Renaissance poet Ludovico Ariosto, um, whom you are, are very familiar with. So, in fact, Scott learned Italian expressly in order to read Ariosto's chivalric romance, Orlando Furioso, in its original language. Um, so this means I'm familiar with the Bronte's works, and I know Scott relatively well, but I've never read Ariosto's Orlando Furioso. Um, and then, this, so this means that there's maybe something lost in translation um, of the literary works and the great texts that I read, and, and that there's some wisdom that I may be gleaning from those more recent works, but perhaps there's wisdom that I'm also losing by not being familiar with these older classical texts um, or classics. Um, and just to give another quick example for listeners who are perhaps familiar with 20th century uh, works is Virginia Woolf's um, fantastical novel Orlando. Um, a, a major subtext of that work is, again, Ariosto's Orlando Furioso. Um, so this, this brings us to, um, I think, um, this question of literary lineage, on one hand, which can often seem unruly and intimidating, um, this question of what do we lose, um, not only in terms of understanding more recent authors and works, um, but what do we lose holistically um, in terms of just broadening, broadening our horizons as readers today if we're, if we're not reaching further back into the history of the great books um, that have come down to us. Um, and, and I wanted to talk to you about the aims and benefits of reading these, these classic texts in and of themselves, for themselves. Why should we read them if we haven't come across them since high school, if we've come across them at all, or if they seem too obscure or historically distant? And, um, and as we talk about this, I wonder if we could think about it in terms of three things. So in terms of what are great books or what are the classics in terms of a co the concept or quality of timelessness in literature that we so often attribute to these classics and then also just in terms of our reading practices when it comes to the classics so i think the first fundamental question to tackle is um what is a great work and what makes a literary classic what it is what would you say thank you very much 
So uh, you're, you're going to keep us on track then insofar as those three questions are concerned, right? Great work, yeah. timelessness, and reading practice. I'm just jotting down a mm -hmm. note so that I don't forget myself. Um, I, I, think, I will do my best. Uh, be, before I say anything further, I want absolutely to disabuse our uh, listeners of the notion that I am an expert in Renaissance literature. <laughs> um, you know, in my case, I think especially the the aphorism that doctoral studies um, focus more and more on less and less until eventually we know everything about nothing. I think that that's really the 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 key here. I I um I love Renaissance literature. I'm constantly astonished by what I encounter. But I couldn't say that I have um, uh, traveled far in realms of gold, so to speak. Um, but uh, I have, you know, I have read Ariosto. And golly, I'd say the first reason to read um, works of this kind is, golly, they're a rollicking good read. I was astonished again and again and again. I sometimes would have to put the book down and think, that is so funny. That's so cool. That's who knew uh, that J.K. Rowling stole the idea of the hippogriff from um, from from Ariosto, for example. Um, so I, I remember reading at one point that um, Ariosto was more widely known before the First World War than Shakespeare. And you know, I, if if you if the person who is interested does take the time to read Ariosto, they'll see why that is the case. Not that I'm advocating that that um, uh, the Orlando Furioso replace the, the Shakespearean uh, canon by any means, but, um, you know, there's, there's more than one genius out there in the world. And I think that's probably the best reason to read the so-called great works. Um, but what exactly is a great work? Mm -hmm. That's really the question, isn't it? And what else is out there that we haven't fully uh, discovered for ourselves, or even more importantly, that culture at large has uh, lost sight of? Um, this was, I think, in, in part, uh, the, the subtext of a conversation that I had in another Renovatio um, uh, sort of panel conversation uh, a, a year or, or two ago um, and I think if I'm if I'm correct uh, I think you've seen that the the video of it is that is that where the idea of, to talk about Ariosto came from yes yes I think it was so, the on post-colonial um, that's it yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> so um, the question of what constitutes a, a, a great work and and why it's great um, I, I think is is one issue to be sure um, it seems to me that no matter what set of criteria we bring to bear upon that question, we have to do so with a degree of uh, humility that recognizes that our contemporary perspective is still truncated, that we can't see everything, even that's on the horizon, let alone the things that now are beyond our field of vision. And the, uh, so if we could use that uh, horizon as a metaphor, for the great works, um, you know, we're, we're dealing with an immensely complex topography. And, um, you know, the best that we can ever do is to pick a set of trails and follow them. But we're more likely to be picking trails that are, uh, that have already been traveled before, um, that are maybe packed down and a little bit more level and stable, um, places where, you know, every, every so often we can take a break and, and sit down and, and there may even be, you know, a, a, a lemonade stand. So <laughs> if, if we think of that as um, the, the, the kinds of criteria that govern our path into the classics, I mean, we have to recognize that there's a, a tremendous degree of cultural and even institutional determination uh, 
that points us in the direction of quote unquote great works. Um, now, that said, I, I'm not saying that these works aren't great. They're magnificent. And partly they're magnificent because they stimulate the best thinking in me. And uh, that, you know, that's not a small thing, it seems to me. Um, and and it's, it's both flattering and enjoyable to become the interlocutor of a Socrates mm. or a Shakespeare or an Ariosto. And to discover that there are more people involved in this conversation, like, for example, Virginia Woolf, wow, that's, that's just an eye-opening experience. And it's something that I, I think lies at the foundation of the kind of intellectual excitement that stimulated me when I was very young. And um, thank goodness continues to stimulate me even now that I'm not very young anymore. So well, I don't know yeah, if that, I mean, that, that's a very subjective uh, notion of what constitutes uh, a great work or the great works. But um, yeah, I'm, 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 I definitely belong to the great conversation uh, interpretation of, of um, the, the genre. Well, I think you're hitting on an excellent um, point about this, this word timeless that we use frequently when we're talking about classics, but then maybe don't quite think about in and of itself, which, um, you know, that word timeless, it has this, you know, connotation of, you know, the perennial and the unfading and the permanent. And, um, and so what you're talking about, this idea that, you know, maybe these paths are downtrodden, maybe others have traversed them frequently. Um, but when you walk down that path, it's new and it's fresh and it awakens, it potentially awakens something within you that is then new and abundant and um, becomes a part of, of the history of, of that work, but is, is still um, a new shoot as it were, as it's kind of organically unfolding through time. Um, so I think you are, that is a, an excellent answer. It's, it's um, an answer that gets at the experience of reading a great book, as opposed to just trying to define the great book itself. Because when it comes to texts, um, I think as scholars of literature, you know, we, we love books. We love the materiality of books. We love um, um, uh, kind of trying to get behind the history of them, um, but the, but it's at the end of the day the reading of them that's the heart of it, and and it's that give and take, that experience between you as the reader and the author who is um, mediated through this text that you can hold in your hands. Um, so I think that's an excellent answer, and, and it's good to think about that experience of reading um, as being something that really constitutes. Uh, a great work. Would you, would you agree, or am I, am I off the mark? I, I, I'm, I'm in substantial agreement with, with everything you said. Uh, although I, it might be worthwhile to conduct a little experiment right here. We, we've, um, we've deployed the term timeless, and if I think if I were going to go for a definition, it, it wouldn't probably be the great work it would be the question of timelessness what, what exactly is that so in my mind while you were speaking I was asking myself what is the opposite of timeless or timelessness mm -hmm. is that in the moment -ness? because golly that's the experience that I feel like I'm having with the quote-unquote classics there's something about them that locks me in the moment more profoundly uh, and more enjoyably than quite a few other things that I might be doing. And um, if, if, uh, if I were going to say what attracts me the most to the great works, it, it would be something, maybe not excluding timelessness, but having necessarily to include other things as well, sometimes even um, opposite things. <laughs> I don't know. Does that, oh. does that sound a little bit too uh, abstract? Maybe. Well, I guess the opposite of timelessness, though, is 
would be ephemerality or the ephemeral, the f maybe. Um, so you have... Yeah, and, and we're certainly having that experience when we read, read the classics as well. Uh, especially the older they are, the more likely there are to be moments that we simply don't connect mm -hmm. anymore. We, we, we well, look think, at this and we say, what on earth is going on here? Well, I, exactly. So I think that was also what I am I would like to, to talk to you about this. Um, you know, in, in thinking about timelessness and thinking about great works, um, there's, there's so much, I think, uh, that is either culturally given to us or that we just pick up somehow or just the intimidation factor. Um, about great works that are pre the 1800s, for instance, or even pre 1900s. And um, it's just, it's, it's intimidating. And there's just a sense that there's not anything relevant that I can learn from something that was written in another language, in another culture, potentially on another continent, and in a completely different set of political circumstances, or um, with, you know, when there was a completely different set of technological um, advancement um, that that there's just no uh, shared footing or ground mm -hmm. for, for me to stand on with, with myself and the author. And, and in a way, this um, prevents us then from setting forth on that on one of those paths to just see where it leads and that kind of curiosity. So I I was when I was reading a little bit in preparation for this about Ariosto, I, I read something by Barbara Reynolds, who was a 20th century translator of Ariosto into English. And um, she, she wrote that of, if, if Ariosto wrote um, Orlando Furioso for anything, it was for sheer delight to, to offer listeners and readers, just the sheer delight of the read. Um, and yet you still in a way feel that in order to approach that text that you need to read an introduction in order to get yourself prepared for what's ahead or you need to learn a little bit about the historical context or, and you don't, I'm not saying you need to do these things. I think you can easily pick up the book as long as you can read the language and throw yourself into it and just see what happens. But there are all of these um, roadblocks in a sense that prevent us from walking down these paths. and. And I wonder what you would say if you if you could say a few words about how you, how would you encourage listeners to to ignore those roadblocks um, so that they're not in a way um, missing out in in a sense or um, failing to gain maybe some either wisdom or virtue or experience from reading books that. Um, are considered great, but but also can offer an individual um, something that nothing else could, you know, because they're you know each work is so unique and has its own set of of uh, gifts and things to offer. Well, by and large, uh, our contemporary experience of Western culture is not deterred from tourism. I mean, we'll we'll go to Athens and we'll hike up. Uh, to the to see the Acropolis, won't we? And um, I, we'll I have often done that, actually. <laughs> in, we'll invest tremendous resources in doing such things. I, I know of um, persons who, you know, who save and save and save uh, for for decades, and they do so precisely in order to make trips like that. Right, that's the 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 realms of gold. Um, uh, reference that, that I uh, deployed earlier in our conversation. And I think, you know, the, the thing to remember here is that when Keats made those journeys, at least initially, he did so entirely through textual experience. Mm. Much, he said, have I traveled in realms of gold. So, golly, um, Imagine having those experiences um, without first having to defer them to, to retirement. Imagine living those experiences right along with whatever other demands our lives place upon us. I mean, that's 
that's why we read, right? That's why our parents encouraged us to do, uh, you know, to, 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 to stay up late at night as long as we to were in, in bed. To be in two places. <laughs> yeah, to be, to be in two places at once. And I, I, I just, I, I think that um, probably the, the, the greatest motivation, especially, you know, when we're young, is pleasure. And the pleasure is substantial. Sure, there are a lot of things that are unfamiliar, but it's precisely that unfamiliarity that, that draws us to, quote unquote, see the sights. And um, yeah, I think that the, the more we do it, the more we want it, as a matter of fact. And the less we are deterred by what is unfamiliar. And really, you know, if you think about it, all literature is, at least to some degree, an experiment in defamiliarizing the familiar. I, I mean, poetic language itself is, grammatically speaking, not different from the language we speak, but it comes out in an unfamiliar way. It is precisely that defamiliarization that draws us to it. What is this new thing that I'm looking mm -hmm. at? This extraordinary way of uh, saying something that I, I say a million times, but in an infinitely more prosaic way. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. part of what attracts us, I think, to, to reading and, and, um, and likewise to the great works. So have you, yeah. have you, have you dived into to Ariosto already? I, well, I've read the opening um, and a few passages, um, but I, I haven't started it in earnest. I've ordered a copy so I can sit down and read it in my hands as opposed to um, on, on the screen, a, which I, a digital I much version, prefer. Yeah. Um, it's funny that what you, you mentioned um, this like defamiliarization and because you also just mentioned Keats, it reminds me of one of his very short poems. Um, this living hand now warm and capable. Have you, do you are you familiar with that? And um, I am, yes. I'll just say it quickly for listeners, but um, this living hand now warm and capable of earnest grasping would if it were cold and in the icy silence of the tomb. So haunt thy days and chill thy dreaming nights that thou would wish thine own heart dry of blood. So in my veins, red life might stream again and thou be conscience calmed. See, here it is, I hold it towards you. And just this idea of this image of a hand being held out in greeting or salutation, or, I mean, you never really think of a handshake the same way again, if you're very familiar with this poem by Keith. Um, and you're right, that defamiliarization, that kind of, in a way it is that, that, that um, literature sometimes forces you to be, or teaches you, I would say, to be aware of moments or in moments more profoundly um, and to see things more profoundly than you might otherwise uh, do. Um, so here we, you know, Keyes' poem, it's, it th makes us think of our own mortality, the mortality of those around us. Um, empathy, you know, wanting to maybe give another life and sacrifice ourselves for their sake. And then also just to think about our own hands or the hands of others differently when we see them in the day to day. And um, anyway, that's a, a huge digression, but it is just something that, that came Not to at all, it's very pertinent. Uh, Keats is uh, focusing our attention on the afterlife, isn't he? Mm -hmm. And it's not only the afterlife in uh, an explicitly religious sense in fact it's not even primarily that it's a kind of a afterlife of the artistic experience and that really mm -hmm. is is what we're experiencing in when we read ariosto today we are we are not the 16th century uh, italian courtly audience he had in mind but when, when we read the Orlando, we have a, a significant experience nonetheless of a work uh, 
that we experience primarily as uh, uh, something, I guess, to, to use Walter Benjamin's term, in, in, um, in its afterlife. And maybe that's a, a, a good way of thinking about great works. Great works are, are the works that have a significant, moving, influential afterlife. And then what would you uh, say by becoming a part of these afterlives or, or immersing ourselves in, in them? What is, I guess, I guess we can also use Keats to touch on, you know, not just, it's not just uh, the, the delight that we gain from reading, um, but is it the virtuosity or is it the um, kind of meditativeness that we can have in the day to day that we're taught or what else are we gaining from reading great works or timeless Works. You know, we since, since we've we've referenced uh, Chapman's Homer several times in the course of our conversation, I, I have to point out that when finally I had a copy of Chapman's Homer in my hand and started reading through it, I was terribly disappointed. I thought this this is not a great translation, <laughs> and I, I don't I, maybe maybe uh, that's just a, um, a an entirely idiosyncratic response, but so. Um, I'm struck in this case by how a, a very, very small piece of Homer um, filtered through many generations and a frankly idiosyncratic um, uh, 16th century translation um, nonetheless seems to capture in uh, those uh, well-known lines of Keats, um, something uh, of the experience that probably very many of us had reading the Iliad and the Odyssey especially. There is a kind of uh, foundational uh, joy that bubbles over in the Keats verse that reminds us of how we felt when we were having that encounter at last with Homer. Um, so, golly, <laughs> that's where I'd start. I'd start with that fundamental experience of joy. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm going back to, to my to recollection of, of my childhood when, um, you know, my this is back in the days when your parents made you go to bed at seven o'clock. And, um, and of course, no more television, right? But they would let us stay awake as long as we liked, as long as we were in bed and reading. But the minute, you know, you put the book down, you couldn't be playing a game in bed or... No, you had to be reading. So reading became our television, our entertainment, our uh, nightly going to the movies in a way that now when you can just, you know, stay up all night watching Netflix, you don't have anything like the same experience. You get maybe the same insomnia, but you don't have well, you anything to show for it. Yeah, you meant, well, you mentioned joy, this word joy. So how are you using that, that word? Because I think that seems to be at the heart of this experience yeah, you're, you're talking about. It's, it's what compels you to keep turning the pages. And, um, and, and waiting to hear what's about to happen next. This is what kept Scheherazade alive for, for a thousand and one nights. And I'm telling you, it's still keeping us alive. It's mm -hmm. giving us reason to move decisively into the next day. And, um, and, you know, then looking forward in the course of that day, to having those experiences of joy again. So there's a, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe that's too, um, uh, too idealistic a view of, of reading, but at, at, when I was a child, there's no doubt about it. Reading was, I mean, it was probably the, the, the best thing that um, I could do in the course of a day. <laughs> 
So then how how should we go about choosing what to read next? Because there is, I, I do find, you know, with there's that idea of, um, you know, Harold Bloom's idea of the anxiety of influence, this idea that authors, you, you almost feel like you've um, failed before you've begun because of the, um, the weight of the the greatness of works and of literary works that have come before you but even for readers i think there's almost this this kind of anxiety well what should i read next um i want to read this but i'm not sure if i should read that which one would be better and then you maybe just end up watching netflix instead because you can't decide so how would how how should we go about choosing what to read especially if we're not already ensconced in a way in in a particular time period, the way I'm a Victorianist or the way you have a love of the literature of the Renaissance. Um, what what mean, advice I, I would think, you give? I think, I think we do it by entering into conversation with others. I mean, I was tremendously blessed because I spent a lot of time with my grandparents and with um, the, the relatives in my parents' generation who were always asking me, so what are you reading? Do you like it? Have you thought of this? You should look at this. And it's precisely that conversation that um, led me, I can't say purposefully, but decisively from one encounter to another, to another, to another um, with really fantastic literature. So you know, on the one hand, reading appears to us to be a kind of solitary activity. But if we're reading things that our grandparents read and enjoyed when they were children, then we're sharing something very concrete with our grandparents, aren't we? So it, it made a lot of difference to me to hear uh, the, the adults in the family say, oh, well, if you like this, then you might like this, <laughs> right? Um, so when there's I, um, a choice, though, between something that's a contemporary work or a modern work and something that's more ancient and perhaps unfamiliar, I'm not to, not to say that it should always be one or the other, but what would you say are the relative benefits of each and and this in a way we could think a little bit about what i was talking about in the beginning we've talked about great works we've talked about um timelessness um but also i i wanted to touch a bit on reading practices themselves you know we read in many different ways for many different reasons we read as students we read for pleasure we read to escape um we read to learn um when it comes to choosing what to read or how to approach different very different kinds of texts, like an ancient work that's been translated into English or something more modern that was from an Anglophone tradition. Um, what advice would you give or, or what, what thoughts do you have on that? Do you know what Ancestry.com is? Yes. I mean, I, I I'm so. not on Ancestry.com, but I I'm probably one of the few 60 year olds out there who isn't. Now think about that. Here we are, um, you know, if, if God wills, maybe I've got another 20 years or so left. And many of my peers in age find themselves fascinated, riveted, by the question of who are my ancestors? Who came before me? What kinds of experiences did they have? What sort of people were they? Mm. This is, um, I don't know if this is um, uh, the expression of a particularly contemporary American anxiety about rootlessness or not. But I do know that reading the classics satisfies those questions in a profound way. Because the minute that I can start formulating to myself the question, who are my ancestors intellectually? <laughs> 
Mm. How did I come to see the world the way I do? That, I mean, that's the reason that we're, we're reading the works that influenced the works <laughs> that we've derived so much pleasure from. It's a similar kind of, of impulse, it seems to me, and it's not wrong um, uh, to, to ask the question, who were these people? What were their, what were their great moments? And what were their great disappointments? Uh, and then those how are the did kinds they of questions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and those are the kinds of, of questions that um, that make us more compassionate. Excellent. So, um, I think if if you could give us Father Francisco. Um, a final um, piece of advice to listeners, I would say, which is um, not one that they have to follow. But if you were to give uh, um, three texts that you have loved and enjoyed and benefited from, um, what would you offer up to readers or to our listeners um, to maybe pick up next or consider next? Well, if you don't go straight for the Penguin Classics version of Orlando Furioso, Waldman's translation, man, you guys are not listening. It is a <laughs> rollicking good read, and you will, uh, you will not regret it. So yeah, I hear there's, there's a trip maybe, to let's the just, moon. <laughs> let's just let's just put that at the top of the list. But you know, I I, I would say that um, that that trip to the moon. How can I how can I put that? You know, um, Astolfo uh, is led to the moon by Saint John, for Pete's sake. Right? He flies on the back of a hippogriff. Mm -hmm. He finds Orlando's wits in in a file, right? A, a kind of test tube. And when he, when he goes to pick it up, he discovers that it's way heavier than he anticipates. I mean, that, there's so much going on there, right? Um, literally, of course, this is, as I've said before, a rollicking good read. But, I mean, isn't Ariosto also saying something about spiritual counsel? You know, here we are in the heavens. We're led there by... Uh, the, the evangelist and and we're yeah, going and there why to recover our wits mm -hmm. well and I isn't mean, the I, moon <clears throat> in this in this cosmos or this story isn't the moon the place of all lost things on earth so anything that you've lost on earth you go to the heavens to find you go to the moon to find but but especially your wits because that's what makes you a lunatic on the earth that your wits have gone up to the luna, to the moon. Um, yeah, so so by all means, folks, uh, and I don't even know um, who owns the um, the rights to that translation, but wh whoever it is, I'm giving you a plug. It's a it's a it's a a great version in English. Um, but so so, what if you were to do this? What if you were to um, go after Ariosto? And then, when you when you reach the end, then read the introduction and find out who who his influences were, were or whom he influenced. I mean, that's bound to lead you, if not to the Bronte sisters, for example, whom it, it's it's not necessarily the case that everybody has read. Um, maybe it'll maybe it'll lead them to Walter Scott. I don't get the impression people read Walter Scott very much anymore, and it's too bad because. <laughs> He is a lot of fun as well, mm -hmm. and um, I didn't. I myself didn't even know that he he read um, and admired Ariosto. I, I know that he read and admired Austin, but he doesn't imitate Austin. He imitates Ariosto. That's for sure. I can see it now that you've said so, um, and 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 that comes from the um, you know the 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 tremendous experience of adventure that's embodied in in those um, narratives. Mm 
and the way they spin off in all kinds of interesting directions. So instead of giving a complete list, why not just let me make that recommendation as a starting point and then see where, where it might lead you, whether forward or backward or, or uh, s s stepping aside to contemporaries. It'd be an interesting journey. I think so. And that I was about to say that fits very well with your metaphor at the opening of this discussion of following a pathway um, and going on a journey. So um, let me just thank you, Father Francisco, so much for You're being welcome. Uh, with me today and talking uh, to me and to our listeners. And um, um, yeah, I think we've all benefited from, from what you've had to share. So thank you very much. Many blessings to you. Mm -hmm.